How does life itself really function, in all of its different forms from the largest all the way down to the minuscule? When one studies and researches this, the field is called life sciences. It's all about how living organisms function, interact within, and affect their surroundings. Biology and medicine are two major areas of the life sciences. But here we also meet scientists in engineering, chemistry, and even physics. An essential part of this is research around life's most basic building block, the cell. It involves, among other things, discovery and mapping of all the different cell types. To understand how a cell reads its own DNA code. To find the cell's hidden tasks. And to understand how cells get the energy they need to survive. If scientists succeed in uncovering all the secrets of the cell, it can be a tremendous benefit for all humanity. In a small room, at the Karolinska Institute sits a scientist with big plans. Stan Linderson wants to accomplish a monumental project. But in order to understand what it is he wants to do, we need to go back a few years in time. The year 2000 saw a major scientific breakthrough, the completion of the Human Genome Project. Researchers were successful in mapping all of the genes in human DNA. The unique code of our cells that makes us human. The news rang out all over the world, and the results were presented by the then President of the United States, Bill Clinton. Without a doubt, this is the most important, most wondrous map ever produced by humankind. Now it's time to take the next step. In line with the huge task of mapping the human genome, Stan Linerson now wants to map cells in what is called the Human Cell Atlas. The Human Cell Atlas is a very ambitious project. And in scale, I think you can fairly compare it to the genome project. We aim to generate an atlas of all cell types in the human body. And the idea is that it's both an atlas uh, in, in the sense of a catalog, but it's also an actual three-dimensional map of the body that shows you in each organ what types of cells it, it consists of. And we are getting together internationally and inviting all parts of the scientific community to join in. To grasp the concept of what scientists want to do, we need to look closely at the structure of the cell. Cells are surrounded by a thin membrane of fat. Inside, they are filled with liquid, containing, among other things, nutrients and proteins. In the nucleus, we find the genes in the DNA code. The same DNA blueprints are found in all of the cells of an individual. The problem is that each cell type, in order to create its own unique characteristics, uses only certain parts of these DNA blueprints. And researchers do not know which ones they are, or how many different cell types exist. As we've obtained more powerful methods in recent years, we've come to realize that organs are much more complex than we thought. So whereas we previously thought there would be a few tens of different types of neurons in the brain, uh, maybe a hundred, now we realize that there are definitely hundreds, maybe thousands of different distinct types of neurons in different parts of the brain. So I think the, the main difference is the level of detail um, and detailed molecular understanding of how tissues and organs work. But now, new opportunities have opened up. A new technology that uses a so-called microfluidic chip, which gives scientists the opportunity to study single cells. So uh, these are uh, microfluidic plates that we use for uh, analyzing uh, DNA from single cells. The technology enables researchers to learn how each individual cell uses its DNA code. And that can reveal new cell types. 
The human cell atlas is still in its infancy, but Sten Linnerson's team has already taken the first step to map the entire brain of a mouse. And so here we're looking at uh, a part of the brain. The colors here show you cells that have been detected. The small dots represent the different parts of the DNA code that cells use. And a specific mix of dots then forms its own cell type. The green and blue, that's one type of cells. And, and the brown and, uh, and white, that's another type of cell. And the pink is a third type of cell. So this allows us to see multiple cell types in the same tissue at the same time. And it's actually the first time that we're able to, to do this kind of highly multiplexed imaging. The survey has taken a long time, but technological advances now happen quickly. The new capabilities make it possible for Sten's team to soon be finished with the whole mouse brain, after which they want to continue with the human. Even though the brain of a mouse is much smaller than the human brain, every part of the brain exists, uh, both in mouse and human, and I think most cell types will be the same. So we can learn a lot by studying the mouse. If the Human Cell Atlas project succeeds in mapping all of the billions of human cells, this will be a fantastic tool. For example, when we want to quickly find the cure against new viruses, such as the Zika virus, which has recently hit the world. The Human Cell Atlas is going to have an important impact in clinical research because it will serve as a reference where you can uh, look up information. And uh, as an example, if you take Zika virus, if we had had the cell atlas, you would have been able to look up this kind of information directly in the atlas, and it would have taken maybe an hour. What makes Sten Linnerson's research possible is the new technique in studying cells individually. We can find a scientist who is working with the development of this technique in Uppsala. Here we can see how the cell reads its own DNA, as a mathematical model, of course. The problem is that the model is not entirely correct. It needs to be improved. This is the mission of Johann Elf at Uppsala University. Johann begins by making a model of how the cells should work according to the old methods using test tubes. And then, with the help of new technology, he looks for how it works in reality and it doesn't always add up. When we try to measure something inside a cell, there's usually something that is totally different than what was assumed from test tubes experiments, that rates are different, or some other molecule that we just didn't uh, know about yeah, that influenced the process. That is why Johan now, through his research, is going to find out how the cell actually reads its DNA. Different cell types use different parts of the DNA code on different occasions. To know which are the relevant parts, the cell must search through all of the DNA. The proteins that do the searching are called transcription factors, and they play a significant role in how the cell functions. In order to study how these transcription factors actually work, Johan needs to look inside single bacterium cells. Previously, they could only study the parts of the cell in a test tube, and the results were rather rough. In place of this, now Johan's team is developing small plates called microfluidic chips, similar to those that Sten Linnerson used at his lab. These uh, microfluidic devices have uh, revolutionized how we work with the bacteria and the imaging. The micro-channels makes it possible to trap individual bacterial cells and keep them growing for days. Johan's team is constantly developing new chips and manufacturing them themselves in the lab. Is that a new mold holder? Yes. Does it work? We'll see. Uh -huh. The researchers first create a mold and design the tiny channels they need. Which mold is that? This is the large mold with the 1,500 nanometer. 
In the mold, they can then cast the chip in plastic. The chip will be bound to a small glass slide. First, the surfaces are treated in a plasma oven. Then small holes are made through which the cells can be inserted, as well as the liquid they will grow in. Now they have the single cells in place. The next step for studying how the cells work in real time is a microscope, filming the cell interior. Johann's team has built its own laser microscope. What we see on the table here is lots of optical components to combine the light from these different lasers into something that we can use to excite the chlorophores inside the cells. The chip is fastened to the microscope, which now can reveal the cell interior with nanometer precision and detect all movements of the transcription factors that occur in less than a millisecond. So this is the first time we can look at gene regulation with transcription factors at uh, this level of resolution. On the screen, they can now follow exactly how the cell searches through its DNA. The result is astounding. Johan's team measured that each transcription factor molecule searches the cell's entire DNA code in just three minutes. That means 25,000 base pairs per second. And doing it with impressive accuracy. They rarely miss their targets, as long as they don't encounter mutations. But if they do, the consequences can be devastating. When this process goes wrong, uh, the cell's regulation doesn't work. That will cause uh, some genetic disease, for instance, or, or uh, such as cancer. Johan takes the results from the films of the cell interior back with him to his calculations. He can now correct them in order to obtain a more accurate mathematical model. This knowledge can then help other research groups understand and counteract the errors that can occur when the cell reads its DNA. Thanks to rapid technological developments, we can now learn more about our cells than was previously possible. But there is still much we do not know about the secret life of our cells. Cells do not only do what we think they do, they also have several unknown functions. And this is of interest to Mia Philipson at Uppsala University. She's taking a closer look at some of our most common immune cells, white blood cells. I find immune cells extremely fascinating because we can find them everywhere in the body, in all organs. And they also use the circulatory system uh, to quickly accumulate at specific sites at certain signals. And uh, if we just understand their full potential or what they can do, I'm sure that we can use their potential in order to um, keep healthy. In order to uncover these unknown functions in immune cells, Mia has to study the cells at work in their normal environment inside a living body. Mia's littlest co-workers are therefore mice. I think it's very important for everyone that works with the mice to feel that they are taken care of the best way as possible. Through a very careful operation, Mia's team can film the immune cells at work in the mouse's body. So the reason for the image to move is that the, the mouse is breathing all the time and has also a heartbeat. And now we are looking at the intestine. The red staining shows the blood vessels and the pink staining marks an immune cell that circulates. It was on one such film a few years ago, Mia discovered something unusual. 
The white blood cells, previously thought to quickly get out of the blood vessels solely in search of bacteria, behaved strangely. They creeped, slowly searching along the blood vessel walls. Mia suspected that during this time they were receiving many other signals from the body, such as oxygen-poor areas that needed help, for example. So she did an experiment. We wanted to understand if these immune cells could sense hypoxia in the tissue. And in order to do so, we developed a model where we transplanted islets that were hypoxic from the isolation, lacked all blood vessels. She studied blood vessel development with transplants in diabetics, where there's a risk that the new insulin-producing islets of Langerhans get too little oxygen and die. And we could see that these sites were swarmed by immune cells that accumulated at the site of hypoxia. The green dots are the immune cells that have gathered by the site of the oxygen deficiency to help build new blood vessels and increase oxygen supply. Here, Mia has discovered a previously completely unknown function of our immune system. And today, she continues with this discovery. The ability to build new blood vessels is also an important part of healing wounds. She is now trying to add the protein that activates immune cells at the location of a wound. Then we measure the area of this wound every day for a period of time in mice that have received no treatment or specific treatment. The result is amazing. In addition to fighting bacteria, the immune cells help the wound heal much faster. And they seem to not only help with the blood vessels, but also in building tissue and sealing the wound. We see a dramatic increase in the healing process, especially so during the first 24 hours, where the wound closes quite a bit. The more we learn about our cells, the more we understand just how advanced they are. One major mystery to solve with cells is how they get their energy. Here at Stockholm University, researcher David Drew is interested in sugar. Cells are like tiny machines that need energy to function. For the cells, the source is sugar. But sugar uptake is also linked with several serious diseases. David explores this, focusing on the sugar fructose. If we could understand how cells take up fructose, uh, we might be able to um, design a, a small molecule to, to change the function of the fructose uptake because increased fructose uptake has been linked to um, disorders such as diabetes or even cancers such as breast cancer. The part of the cell responsible for the uptake of fructose is a protein called GLUT5. It sits on the cell membrane and scans all of the millions of substances that constantly pass the cell. And when it detects fructose, it catches it and passes it through the cell wall so that the cell gets charged up with new energy. You can think of fructose as a key and the fructose transport of GLUT5 like a door. And this combination needs to come together for the, for the sugar to enter the cell. To learn how it works, David must first find out exactly what the GLUT5 protein looks like. But these proteins are extremely small and difficult to bring out. In order to study them, they need to be grown into larger crystals. A robot divides GLUT5 in small compartments, where scientists can try many different methods of getting them to crystallize. And after several years of work, David's team can now grow GLUT5 crystals of sufficiently good quality. Under the microscope, we can see the protein crystals. And these particular protein crystals come together to form shapes that look like stars. From these protein crystals, one can, with the help of a synchrotron light microscope, get pictures down at the atomic level. David's team now can reveal GLUT5's structure and visualize exactly what happens when fructose is captured and passes through the cell membrane. 
So this is, imagine you have a membrane. This is the outside of the cell. And here is the sugar. So fructose comes in the protein. It's recognized by GLUT5, such that it closes on the outside, now opens up the inside. And now the sugar can enter the cell. Thus, David's team now knows how GLUT5 looks and functions. What can they use this for? GLUT5 is expressed uh, very highly in, in some forms of cancer, particularly breast cancer. And this is because breast cancer cells, unlike our normal cells, need a lot more sugar to grow because these cells are rapidly dividing. Um, and breast cells use fructose as a main energy source. So if we had a molecule, which was like fructose, but when it bound, it wasn't transported, but some, somehow locked the protein from working, it would stop the uptake of fructose in the cells and stop the tumor growing. GLUT5 is what takes fructose into all cells, including cancer cells. But if they can find a substance that binds more readily to GLUT5, the GLUT5 protein would be blocked, and fructose molecules would just pass by. Then the cancer cells would run out of energy, which would slow their growth. David now has in his computer scans of millions of different substances and has narrowed it down to 40 possible candidates. Soon his team will begin lab experiments with these substances to see which of them work best. I think uh, cancer is a, is a thief. Um, it robs people of, 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 of lives. So if we were to develop a medicine which was able to, to, to save people from these terrible diseases, then of course that would be immensely gratifying. And uh, I would just be privileged to be a part of that story. Cell research is crucial to understanding how life works. And it is one important part of the large field called life sciences. Now, as research on cells takes a huge step forward, the rapid evolution of technology is crucial. The possibilities are enormous as scientists continue learning more and more about these building blocks of life. For the cell's life is part of our life and of all life on Earth.